And John was like no one else that had lived during that era. He had been raised in obscurity in the waste howl in the wilderness. He catapults on the scene, and John confronts the most powerful man in the land, Herod, over Herod's infidelity and immorality. Herod had had his brother Philip killed, and he had took his brother Philip's wife to be his wife. And no one said anything about it. No one said a single thing about it. John walks up to the palace. He raps on the door. He asks for a hearing with the king, and he looks the king square in the eye, and he says to the king, King, God is not pleased. It is not right for you to have your brother Philip's wife. God is not pleased with that. I shared with you on last week this scene from Robin Hood. Y'all need to go see Robin Hood. It's a good movie, man. I'm giving my endorsement of Robin in the hood. But I share with you again, it was a powerful scene. It was riveted in my mind when King Richard, the Lionheart, he's looking for a righteous man. He's looking for a courageous man. He can't find one in his, all of his army, even though he's loved and revered by all of his soldiers. And there's a little encounter that takes place, and Robin accepts responsibility for his action. And so the king said, ha-ha, I found an honorable man. And so the king asks Robin, he says, am I blessed? Is God pleased with my crusade? King Richard the Lionheart had been on a tenure expedition across the world, advancing the gospel with the sword, with the crusades. And they'd been killing and slaughtering Muslims and forcing Muslims to, to repent and submit to the authority of Christ. So now Richard is on his way back home, and he wants to be received as a hero. And he wants to be anointed as this man of God who's advanced the gospel with the sword. And so Richard asks Robin, he says, is God pleased? Am I blessed? And Robin said to him, he said, no, God is not pleased, and you're not blessed. And Richard said, what do you mean? And Robin said, when we gather together those 2,500 innocent Muslims, most of them women and children. And when we raised our sword and you gave the word to execute them, he said, a little girl who was bound with her hands behind her and she looked me in the eye and he said, it wasn't a look of fear and it wasn't a look of anger. It was a look of pity. Because at that moment when you gave the word, before our sickles and swords took off their heads, we became godless. God left us. God departed from us. No, you're not blessed. No, God is not pleased. So that was the spirit of John the Baptist. So he took his life in his own hands and he, he's incarcerated. He's later beheaded by Herod's soldiers. And so the people revered John. They revered him because of his courage and because of his conviction. And so when Jesus comes on the scene preaching with courage and preaching with conviction and with fire and on top of that Jesus was performing miracles which John did not perform, the people concluded this must be John the Baptist who has been raised from the dead because of the conviction and the courage and the commitment to the truth of the word of God. Coupled with miracles, John must be raised from the dead. And then there are others that say he's Elijah. And John came in the spirit of Elijah. Elijah was a miracle worker. John was not a miracle worker. But Elijah was the most revered of the prophets of antiquity. It was Elijah that had stood, some of the way John stood against Herod, Elijah had stood against the king Ahab and Jezebel and basically pronounced judgment upon them. And so Elijah was known for power because he had performed miracles and for passion because of the zeal he had for the word of God. And so they said, some remind, you remind them of Elijah because of your power to perform miracles and because of your passion, your zeal for the Lord's house when you clean the house of God of the money changers. And then he said, but to others, they said you remind them of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the most beloved, Elijah the most revered, Jeremiah the most beloved, because Jeremiah had been a priest 
before he became a prophet. And as a priest, Jeremiah was endeared to the people because as a priest, he heard the people's problems and he prayed for the people and he went before God and he confessed the people's sins to God and he made sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. And he stood before God, the God of judgment and a sinful people and pleaded with that God would not unleash his judgment against the people. So Elijah was a man of tremendous compassion and a man that was greatly tender hearted and so when Elijah looked at the condition of the nation of Israel, in particular the southern kingdom Judah, he lamented and he cried. And there's a whole book with Elijah crying and bawling like a baby. He is lamenting over the condition of the land. And so they saw in Elijah this tremendous prophet of compassion that was tender hearted, that bore the burden of the people on his shoulders and in his heart. And when they looked at Jesus, they also saw the personality of Elijah. You see this incredible trilogy of personalities that Christ represented. He had the fire of John the Baptist, the courage of John the Baptist, the commitment of John the Baptist. He had the power of Elijah, and he had the principal conviction of Elijah, but it was also mingled, and it was dispersed with the compassion of Jeremiah. So it should be in the church. If we're not careful, we'll become a bunch of doctrinal and theological hardheads. If we're not careful, we become so insensitive to the plight and to the pain and to the pathology of hurting people. People who've been overtaken in a fault, as the Bible says in Galatians 6, brothers, you which are spiritual, if you see one overtaken in a fault, if you see one caught up in sin, you which are spiritual, you go with tenderness and you restore such a one, lest you find you yourself are also tempted, Paul writes in Galatians 6. And Jesus writes, he says, before you try to get the speck out of your brother's eye, get the two by four, get the beam out of your own eye. You can't see clearly because taking something out of somebody's eye is delicate surgery. It's a delicate operation. So you got to have clear spiritual 2020 vision. You must know your own weakness, your own sin, your own foibles before you try to stand in judgment of someone else. He says, so be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. May God grant us here at the Grace Bible Church a spirit of forgiveness. We've had strained relationships. We've had hurt feelings, we've had misunderstandings, but the only way we move forward is that God grant us a spirit of repentance and a spirit of revenge, uh, forgiveness. Some of us need to repent, other of us need to forgive, and some of us need to repent and forgive. And in doing so, God can bring about healing. He really can bring about healing. And so in Jesus, they saw this one, this bruised reed. This man of sorrow that Isaiah writes about in Isaiah chapter 53, a man of sorrow, he was acquainted with grief. Jesus knew the pain of grief. We see that in John chapter 11, verse 25, when he stands before the tomb of his friend Lazarus, Lazarus whom he knew that he would raise from the dead, but he allowed himself to be trapped in a moment in time. The sovereign, omnipotent God allowed himself to feel the full weight and the burden and the pain and the agony of the grief of Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sister. So much so that the most hardened, callous, recalcitrant people in the land, the religious leaders, when they saw Jesus weeping, the Bible says, they said, oh, how he loved him. Speaking of Jesus' love, for Lazarus. So in the church, we have to have this, this combination. We have to be as regal and as courageous, as bold and as strident as John the Baptist. We've got to exude power and undaunted courage to where we would take a water pistol and assault the very gates of hell with it in the name of God. We can show absolutely no fear when dealing with people. But on the other hand, we have to have that balanced tenderness that we don't crush people. We don't break people's spirit. We don't break the spirit of children because they have failed. We give them hope that repentance and forgiveness is available to them. That's what